Taip skamba tavo nauja elektroninė parduotuvė. Savo elektroninę parduotuvę Mario susikūrė su Zairo. Su Zairo neužtruksi. Išsirinki dizainą, sukeli nuotraukas. Užpildai aprašymus. Elektroninė parduotuvė sukasi. Reikia logotipo. Susikurk jį per... Paruošta. Nori paklausti? Mūsų komanda pasiruošusi tau padėti visą parą. Pataiki kaip Grigonis. Susikurk svetainę su Zairo. Eiki www.zairo.lt ir su nuolaidos kodu Zalgiris susikurk savo internetinė svetainę vos nuo 1,50 eurų per mėnesį. Sveiki, mėlėjai, Žalgiris Onair podcast'o žiūrovai, klausytojai nesvarbu, ar jūs žiūrite mūsų YouTube kanale, ar klausite mūsų įvairiose tinklalaidžių platformose. Svarbiausia, kad esate su mumis ir šiandien dar vieną progą pasikalbėti su Žalgiriečiu, kuris mūsų Žalgiris Onair podcast'o studijoje dar nebuvo iki šiol apsilankęs. Ir be jokių ilgesnių įžangų noriu jums prisatyti Kauno Žalgirio komandos pirmoji istorijoje argentinėti Patricio Garino. Ola, Patricio. Ola, mai vienas. Uh, so, you are here, our first very own Argentinian in Jalgiris Kaunas club. Did you know this fact before coming to Kaunas that you're going to be the first Argentinian in the Kaunas Jalgiris history? Yes, I think I'm the second one in Lithuania ever. The first one was La Favritola, that was in, in Ritas. Yeah. But I knew for sure I was the first one in, in Jalgiris. So. And this season we already had the third one, uh, Amigo from Las Feliz, yeah? Yes, well... It's a little in between. He's American. His dad is from Argentina. Oh, yeah. His mom was from Mexico. Yeah. Uh, so, so true Argentinians only two. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So before coming here uh, in Litu to Lithuania, yeah, did you have talks with Nicola Provitola about here about what's up with Lithuania? Yeah. Lithuania? Yeah. I mean, he told me the same that everybody else had told me about Lithuania that it's pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But not my tales. Uh, he told me Kaunas uh, was beautiful, um, that people were super nice, but not, not really many talks about the lives, mostly about basketball. Yeah. Um, so we were really surprised when we got here, not knowing that much. Uh, we were a little, um, not nervous, but you know, it's, it's a different culture than we, we're used to from Argentina or even Spain. Uh, I wouldn't know where we're, we're going to find out. And Today we're super happy with with everything, with the the people, the food, uh, the weather was it was bad this year. The winter was Very pretty bad. cold, uh, but for us, the first time that we see that much snow and uh, living in minus twenty is something that we <laughs> never experienced before. And to live it one time, it's it's pretty fun to us. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about basketball, about you coming here to Jalgiris, but first I want to know your impression more about our country. You know, uh, you came here with your girlfriend and your dog, yeah? Yes. Uh, how much of a uh, Google research have you <laughs> had you done uh, before coming here and so on? A lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it, it's been great. Uh, just uh, Googling about Kaunas, how many things you, you can do here with going out to restaurants, museums, all the the nature that we love to go outside, the different forests, and you can do so much uh, trekking and walking around, especially with the dog. I mean, once my agent told me we had an offer from Chargers, I think it was a very easy decision. I know that uh, kitchen things are quite important in your life, yeah? Uh, you are responsible for making empanadas, you have your own business. Uh, how did it all start? Can you briefly explain? Well, it came out of, out of the blue. Uh, it started in Vitoria with um, a couple of my partners uh, yeah. today. They had Argentinian restaurants in, in Vitoria. And she's one time she was playing around that we were going to um, get together and get a new restaurant in, in Vitoria or in Spain for... Argentinian food, um, but that was all jokes and, and funny, and eventually <laughs> it became true. Uh, it's not actually a, a real restaurant that you sit down with tables yeah, yeah. and everything. It's more like take away and, and, and get it to go, um, but it's empanadas. It's a typical dish from, from Argentina, um, and it, it was born just out of the jokes. Uh, it became a reality, and today is, is very successful, and Actually, we have three stores in, in Vitoria. We're going to have two in Bilbao. We're going to have in San Sebastian. We're about to expand all over the north of Spain. So we're 
surprised but really happy. Uh, the other thing is that were you connected with uh, making food, making dishes before you joined this business? Were you good in kitchen making uh, empanadas by yourself? No, no, not really, not at all. I was never into the the, the restaurant business. Um, actually, in college, I studied um, business administration and marketing. Yeah, and that's sort of my role right. in in this in this business. Um, my mom is actually a chef, so <laughs> I'm kind of connected, but I, I've, I've never been in a kitchen. I, I don't know how it works. The other day that we did the interview here in Sala, it's uh, outside my business. It's the second time I've been in a, in a real kitchen in a restaurant. So it's something that I, I'm not good at it. I, I'm not involved. But it's, it's actually really fun once you get to know the, the different environment, how they work, the craziness of, of the kitchen, especially in, in a real restaurant. It is something really exciting and that I like a lot. Uh, to our listeners, uh, we're gonna some we're gonna do some explanation. Yeah, empanadas are like uh, kibine in Lithuania. Yes, exactly. So it, it's almost almost the same. I think the dough is is a little more thin. Yeah. from the empanadas. And the feeling like the the kibina, you can put anything in it. We yeah. have like 16, 18 different flavors from meat, chicken, ham and cheese, spinach, even sweet ones with Nutella or All cheesecake. Right. We have everything. And it's just the way that you close. The kibina here is like on the top, it has yes. a little texture. We do it on the side. All right. So, but it's pretty much the same. Yeah. When you were playing um, Basconia and when you opened, uh, when you joined that business, were you the one that used to uh, bring some of the production to the team? Yeah. Yes, a lot of times. Um, How actually, did you like it? I mean, they love it. Obviously, uh, it, it was kind of funny because we opened and 15 days after we we had to quarantine because of the pandemic. Uh, so it was last year, yeah. Yes, in yeah. 2019, in February, 14 of February, we opened, and 13 of March, we were all locked in <laughs> at <laughs> home. Right. Um, but we did a lot of deliveries to the guys through the houses and and even today the guys after games they order and we managed to get them so you adapted to the situation yeah because uh, takeaway places survived during this whole pandemic yeah yes i mean we obviously we never planned for this to happen but it gave us a, a pretty big boost uh, people got to know in Spain, in the north of Spain, it wasn't that common to get delivered a lot or go to a place and take it to go or maybe warm it up at home. And with the pandemic, actually, we were almost, the, I think it was us and like a sushi place and a kebab place open. So the business was really good, even though the, the pandemic. Are you planning to expand here in Lithuania? Maybe search, search the market, see you, see <laughs> the possibilities. We've been talking with Sabonis to bring it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean, it, it'd be awesome. It's just logistics. It's, it's a little far <laughs> to get it going, but it, it's really possible in the future. Who knows? Hey, Patricia, we have our friends, uh, one of our sponsors for, for this podcast, Zyro. They are responsible for uh, creating websites so people can go on Zyro. They can uh, just uh, type their information information, uh, they can make their own website in a very short amount of time for a very cheap amount of money. So if if you expand in Lithuania, I think they're going to help you with your digital things. All oh, right? For sure. We, we're going to contact them and make them do everything in Lithuania because we, we don't have anybody at home that speaks Lithuania, so we need their help. So you have your bag <laughs> here in Lithuania for digital things. Nice. And for our Žalgiris uh, podcast listeners, if you want to create your own website, just use the discount code Žalgiris and you're going to get a 10% discount for your for your website plans for your website. So that's that's all in this topic. But uh, Patricio, we talked about food. What is that you also like to do in your free time? Do you, do you have some kind of strange hobbies? We get this question from our <laughs> listeners uh, very often because they expect basketball players, I don't know, to love knitting, to love diving, or to love something else. But <laughs> do you have this crazy hobby maybe that comes from your childhood in Mar del Plata, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, do you um, have something crazy hobby? No, I'm pretty simple, chill, relax. Uh, Obviously, during the season, it's not much that you can do if you have a crazy hobby. Yeah. First, you're not allowed to. I don't know. I love quads, like the, the four-wheeler um, oh, bike. Yeah. Um, but it's something that I can't do because of contracts. I, <laughs> yeah. I did it when I was younger. Uh, I love, well, my family is from the countryside. I love the, the farm side, the horses and everything. It's something that I can't do anywhere, basically. Uh, so... 
pretty much just walking around with the dog, visiting. We love traveling. We've been all over here in, in Lithuania already. Yeah. The, the little time that we, we could, we went to Palanga, Vilnius, uh, a bunch of places in the forest and the seaside. Um, and um, about that, it's just staying home, watching Netflix, playing some video games sometimes, and just staying with the business, talking to friends. Uh, not much going on, really. Uh, as you mentioned, you come from Mar de Plata, but you come from the countryside of it, yeah? Like a suburbs fro of Mar de Plata or what? Well, actually, no, not even the suburbs. My whole family is from the the countryside, like literally countryside, small, small little village What's town. the name? What's the name? Uh, it's called De La Garma. <laughs> not even people from Argentina know it. <laughs> it's like 4,000 people in it. All right. Um, I was the first one to be born in, in a big city. Mar del Plata is like almost a million people. Yeah. Um, so every summer I will go back to the to the farm and and be around my, my family and cattle, uh, horses, sheep, everything. Driving tractors when I was ten <laughs> years old. <laughs> That's something that I I really love. Uh, but at home in, in my hometown, just from the suburbs, not, nothing crazy. Not downtown, a little outside the city, but it's a big city. So that side of your life made you love nature, made you love animals. Yes. But how did it all start with sports? Because I've read that uh, before you became professional in basketball, you were also interested in uh, swimming, yeah? Yes, a little bit of swimming, a little bit of football. Yeah. Uh, obviously, oh. at home, everybody has to play football when you grow up. It's a up. must. It's, it's, it's a, a must. must. So it's, it's like the way it's here with basketball is with football at home. You know, everybody, what we talk about, what we do is, is football and Messi and the national team, and that's all we do. So we I had to, to try choose uh, one side, like uh, like in uh, Lithuania, you have to choose between Žalgiris or Vilnius. Exactly, it's Boca, uh, Boca Juniors or River Plate. You have and to what side one. you on? River Plate. River Plate, yeah. Not because I care, it's just my family is... You have the, to choose your, River, your roots, You yeah. have to choose someone. <laughs> but I'm, I'm like the black sheep of Argentina. I, I don't know much about football. I, I don't That's like it. That's strange, man. It's very strange. It's like someone from Lithuania didn't like basketball. It's like, yeah. Really? But You're yeah, I, I mean, I, I started playing when I was younger, when I was like four or five years old. And by the time I was six, I was always the goalkeeper because <laughs> I, I was taller than everybody else, not really coordinated. I didn't do very well with my with my feet and my legs. And actually, when I was six, I hit this this kid in, in the leg, and I think I broke a, a bone in his leg. Oh my god! When I was six years old, so yeah. you can imagine how bad I was. <laughs> and after trauma, that day, yeah. yes, after that day, my parents were like, "Okay, I think we're gonna try something, <laughs> something different." Like individual sport, uh, maybe then. Maybe something individual, maybe something different with your legs. You're tall. We're gonna try basketball. My dad used to play basketball when he was younger. When he was in the military, and they brought me to. A little neighborhood club next to my my house, and I actually fell in love with the sport. At that time, uh, Argentina's national men basketball team, when you were like nine or ten years or eleven years old, excuse me, they were amazing. Well, they are amazing right now, but there was a gap when uh, there were a lack of medals. But during that 2002 run in the FIBA World Championship, mm -hmm. 2004 uh, Athens uh, and Olympic gold medal. Were you that kid that were glued to the television and watch all the games? Yes. And in, in the World Cup in 2002, um, I was just listening to my dad talk about it. I was a little too young even to watch and be um, locked into the TV. But I remember perfectly in, in Athens, the, the final, it was like four in the morning at home. Yeah. And I was just glued to the TV, crazy, crying with my dad because they won the gold medal. That's something... It's one of the biggest memories of my my childhood. That was, I think, the moment that I realized I wanted to be a basketball player. Uh, that 2002 final when Hugo Sconocini, yeah, he made that run and Jelko Rebrac uh, apparently <laughs> fouled him, but there was no foul. Uh, does this episode up to this day is like scandalous in Argentina? Very, very, very. Uh, even now, I don't remember watching it as a kid, watching it on replay on YouTube and everything. Uh, he got fouled. But he got fouled. He, he got, got fouled, fouled man. and they didn't call it, and they cost him the the medal. Uh, but I think that's one of the situations that that team learned from it and got motivated, and it led to the sports gold medal. anger. Yeah, you mean yeah. yes, they needed revenge, and they they got it. 
Have you ever talked with someone from that team? Uh, well, Skull apparently played with him, but maybe Hugo Sconocini about the episode. Have you ever had this moment to talk like, oh my God, they robbed us? Now with Hugo Sconocini, I mean, we all really close when, when we got to the national team. When, when I was uh, 21, 22 that I started playing with the national team, we still had uh, Delfino, Nocioni, Brigioni, Ginobili, Scola. They were all still around and we, we talked with them. Uh, they don't really want to talk about it too yeah, much. Like too painful, they, yeah. they, it's, it's really painful. It's a thing that they feel up to up to today, even after winning gold medals in the Olympics, winning championship in the NBA. All they think about is, is that moment, and they're not happy about it. It's funny how the things can be connected even between different countries because in Lithuania, we had this similar final in 1995 European mm -hmm. Championship against Yugoslavia also. And then uh, we have a lot of anger because maybe of the refereeing that they took the gold medal from us, that narrative, yeah. you know, up to this day, they, it's still alive. So I can't imagine what your country does feel about it. Yeah. Uh, when you were only 16 years old, yeah, you moved to United States. Uh, I, I can't imagine, it's not a typical way for Argentinian uh, school uh, schoolboy to go to United States, not after the school, but during the school years, yeah? yeah. So why did you choose this path uh, so early? It was obviously not common. The only role model we had in Argentina that did that was Pepe Sanchez, yeah. uh, the point guard from the national team, and he went to Temple University. Um, and that was the only case that was really known at home. We had we had two more other kids uh, at the time that were in college when I was still in high school, that I was in contact with them and asking them. And I had offers to go pro in Argentina already. I, I came from this little neighborhood club uh, that didn't play pro. Uh, I had offers from Argentina and even from, from Europe, from Spain and Italy for a few teams that I was too young and Obviously, my dream was to play in the NBA, and this offer came after uh, one of the Basketball Without Borders camps yeah. in, in Americas, uh, and they offered me a, a help to find a scholarship for, for college, but I was too young. I still had two more years of, of high school, and they offered to find a, a high school, and they told me it was like, going to even be better because I could adapt to the system, the language, yeah. the school, basketball-wise, too, that is very different. Did you know English at that time, or you just went... Uh... I thought I did, but <laughs> I did nothing. <laughs> I understand some of it uh, at the time, but I couldn't speak, even my first year in, in high school in, in Orlando. Uh, I was in Orlando, so I had a bunch of friends from Latin America yes. that I was speaking Spanish all the time. And the climate was good there, yeah? Yes, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on the court, it's basically the same thing, pick and roll and everything is, is easy to catch up. So it took me a whole year to actually be fluent in English uh, in there. But did, did you have this like a hard time when you were in America that you realized, oh man, I'm... I'm not going to love this or it's, was it like, okay, I'm going to do it and I'm going to be a pro no matter what? No, it, it was, it was a feeling that when they got me the news at this camp, I was like, I'm going to do it. I was 16. I called my parents. I was in Mexico and I told them, I didn't ask them. I told them I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Yeah. yeah. I'm going <laughs> to go to high school and I'm going to go to college and I'm, I'm going to do that. And they were like, wait, you want to think about it? You No, no, this is decided. And it's something that they supported supported from the first moment because um, the philosophy in our family is that we, we needed a, a plan B because, I don't know, they, they didn't see me achieving a, a, so much in, in basketball like I did up to Choose up a today. serious profession, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a serious profession, but it's just in case you, you need a, a title, All something right. to survive. We, we were thinking, yes, the, the golden generation, they were... Everybody at home thought they were one in a million. They were like, you're not going to be Ginobili or Nocioni or Scola that you're going to play in the NBA and have your life set. You, you need a plan B or something. And and going to college, having a, a college degree was something that we really liked. I'm, I always like, I'm a not a nerd, but <laughs> I like studying and, and learning new things. And it's something that convinced me from the first moment. It's, it's a different situation because... For six years, I wasn't going to get paid. I was yeah. just going to study and play basketball and, and trying to uh, get better to achieve that ultimate goal to play in the NBA. 
But I mean, I, I loved it from the first moment. Obviously, when I got to Orlando, I, w I was super nervous being 16 year old. Yes, uh, of course. Leaving home. I remember going to the bus station in, in Mar del Plata and all my friends were there. And I was like with my mom crying, <laughs> desperate. I was actually so nervous that I got sick on the plane. I was like with fever and I flew and everything. And I, we went to Orlando actually for a few days before I had to be there so we could see around, yeah. go to the Disney and everything. And I hated it. I was so <laughs> sick. I wanted to go home. I, I missed my family, my friends already. And actually when my coach picked me up from the hotel and we went to the high school, I was like, wow, this is like the movies. It's like a campus with all the people there that you have, that you see on the movies. And I was like, yeah. wow. No, I love this. <laughs> See you, mom. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> I'm great. And I, I don't think in the two years of high school, I never had a bad feeling or bad moment. Just one time, the first time that I missed my dad's birthday yeah. uh, in November that first year, that's when I remember being being sad, but it's not like I cried or anything. I was like bummed out that I couldn't at that be moment, with yeah. at that moment at night because in, during the day we were so busy. I was super tired. And when I went to bed, I was like, oh, I'm a little sad, but... Okay, fell asleep and the next day was a, a new day and that was it. So after high school, you chose George Washington uh, University, Colonial University, yeah? Yes, George the, Washington. The, the Colonials is the mascot, yeah. Uh, why was this university first of choice or you had different offers on your table that you had to choose between? How did the whole process go for you? It was... Uh, Different process for me. Usually, the guys that play in, in America they stay during the summer to play these tournaments called AAU. Yes, and that's how the the university coaches get to know the players and see how they play and everything. But both summers, I went to to home to play with the national team, uh, so I, I didn't have that many offers. I had a few offers from from big schools. But I, I didn't want to go to a big, big school because usually the first year, if you're not ready, they usually make you sit out and wait or not play much. And I wanted to go somewhere that I could play right away. So I had a few offers from, from middle schools, middle level schools. And George Washington, actually my first year high school coach was an assistant at that university. All right. So that made that decision pretty easy. And I knew I was going to play. Uh, I didn't think I was going to start right away, but I started all four years. It's right not away. usual for a rookie. Yeah. Not very usual. And being in Washington, D.C. with uh, people from all over the world, different cultures, and I knew I was going to do well there. So it was a wonderful experience. I mean, living in, in, in college, it's like, again, like another movie and, and studying and playing basketball and, and getting closer to that goal was something that I... I really enjoyed that time. It's something not usual at home or even Europe, but I, if I had to choose, I would do it again for sure. I like how you mentioned a couple of times studying because it's not it's not usual. It's sometimes you hear like stereotypical, like, okay, I play for college, but I did not do a lot of studying during that time because I'm all focused on my professional career. Was it that studying aspect important also during that university years of yours when you were at George Washington's? Yes, it, it actually made it a, a point, the coaches that, we had to study uh, for real. It's you not have to that have we the grades, yeah. Yes, we, we had to have a, a certain grade to play. And actually one time we had a class at eight in the morning with like three of my other teammates. The night before we came back from a trip at like three, three in the morning, three something. And we're like talking on, on the bus. We're like, we're not going to go to class at eight in the morning tomorrow. <laughs> we're super tired. And... They f they made us go to breakfast and they checked that we go eat breakfast and then go to class. Oh my god! And so we went to breakfast and from breakfast we went back to the the building to go nap. And at like eight oh five, I got a call from one of the assistant coaches. He was like, "Who are you guys?" I was like, "Ah, oh, crap." You had to be <laughs> class, yeah. We were supposed to be in class and yeah. I was already in bed. I was like, "Oh no, sorry, I had to go to the bathroom. I'm not feeling very well." <laughs> It was like, oh, okay, where are your teammates? I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and they were like next to me. So we were like, ah, oh, we have to go. And 
we were late and he made such a big deal that he, they even called my parents who were in Argentina that didn't speak any English. My mom called me and was like, what do you do? You rob a bank or you kill somebody? So, like they made it Let me like, get this straight. So they called your parents and they talked in English and your parents listened uh, not knowing any English? Yeah? Yes. <laughs> I mean, we, we had an assistant coach that spoke a little Spanish, but not too much. And my mom called me. I was like, mom, we should skip, muy mal, skip Patricio, one muy mal. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, they made it seem like Like you did something so wrong, not that you skip a class. And actually the next morning we had to work out at six in the morning as, as punishment because we missed one class. So yeah, studying was really important. But I can't imagine what could be running through the mother's head when you, when you hear a she call. She was desperate, you, uh, yeah. She thought what, something what happened, was really what wrong. Yeah. yeah, she called me right away. I, I was in class. I was like, mom, I'm in class. I, I call you later. And I called her. She was like, what happened? <laughs> I was like, we tried to skip one class. We didn't do anything wrong. It's just, we're tired. I was like, oh my God, they scared the life out of me. I thought something happened. I didn't understand a word that they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> But after that, no problem, yeah? After that, we never skip a class again and we had to study and everything. I mean, it, it was hard, obviously, because of the practice, you're tired and you have to do everything. It's not like I was studying engineering or, yeah, or, or being a doctor. I mean... It, it was hard. It's not like super easy, but we, we could manage. In 2014, with your university, you reached the second round of uh, March Madness. Yeah, am I right? Uh, what was special about that round? Were you guys underdogs at that time? Nobody expected you to go to the March Madness? No, no, never. Um, it, it was very special. March Madness there is... is It's a whole event in the whole country. Are you still a fan of it? Yes. I mean, I don't watch too much about yeah. it, but it's, it's all over the place, all over the news. We have friends that are coaching in different teams now and we're always following. But it's just such a big event. It's like the Super Bowl and March Madness. It's, it's right right there in, in the importance. And the whole country just shuts down to watch TV and yeah. watch these kids play basketball. And just... Uh, Even in the school, it was the first time that we made the March Madness since like 14, 15 years in the yeah. in the in the school. So it was like partying everywhere. <laughs> But before we left on on the trip, like the whole school was like a parade just to say goodbye, good luck. And we were came back. Everything was a party. And even though we lost, it was like everybody so happy, and it was an incredible experience. It's it's something that you can't believe there is so much organization and so much money thrown out in, into an event for some guys that don't make money. They're amateurs. They, they don't play basketball that great. They're, they're kids, but they just love it. So listeners have to realize the fact that when you guys went to the March Madness, when you reached the second round, a lot of universities around the area, they didn't even make it to it, even though they were bigger universities. Yeah, maybe, yeah? Yeah, so I mean, we have Georgetown, that it was like <laughs> two kilometers away. Yeah. And there is a very good a huge school. Huge yeah, yeah. Allen Iverson went there uh, last morning, a lot of big stars. Maryland is a school that I was... 30 minutes away that are much bigger schools and they, they didn't make it that year. So it's crazy how like a little school can make it and some others can't. It's, that's, that's why they, they love it so much. The, the underdogs, the, the fairy, t fairy tale story that a smaller school can beat a, a bigger school is something that is really attractive to them. Did it end it for your team in a painful matter, that second round loss? I, I don't remember the score. Can you can you just... Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a, a good game. It, it was, we tried our best. We knew we didn't really have a chance. <laughs> so <laughs> you didn't lose by the, one point. Oh my God. No, no, no. It, it was, I mean, nobody expected us to win. And we, we had the hope. We always, we, obviously, we, we fought and and we, we tried to get our best. But at the end of the day, it's just achieving that point for us was... Uh, crazy and we were we were happy not not in the moment but when we got home uh it was it was very special uh talking about special 2016 year was special for you you graduated from your university uh you joined your national team for the olympic games in rio uh did you expect first of all my question is did, did you expect to be drafted on the nba draft were the hopes of you being selected by some teams um 
I think that whole process was a surprise after surprise. Yeah, uh, before the draft, you you usually get invited to different teams yes. to work out and have the the combine and people, all the scouts, scouters watching you practice basically. And talking to my agent, I thought I was gonna have okay, maybe one, two, three workouts. Ended up having going to fourteen different 14? franchises, fourteen in like month and a half. So traveling all over, going from the east coast to the west coast. Uh, one day practicing in the morning in in Sacramento, and and the next morning practicing in Oklahoma, and visiting Man. all the NBA um, facilities and all the people and. It's a world that is, is fascinating, the way they, they behave, how much uh, resources they have, everything for the players to get better and obviously trying to win, but it's all about the players. And just that whole situation, having 14 workouts, I was like, well, <laughs> this is crazy. Okay, I might have a chance. It is crazy. And yeah. came draft night, I obviously not expecting to be drafted in the first round, even the second one. And I had a chance to get drafted 58 or 59 almost at, at the end and we decided not not to do it with my agent so i could be free to go play anywhere and i have my my rights to one team uh but just i uh, see so you, you took away the, yourself from the draft so I, I was in the draft and they usually call you a, a little bit before to confirm that you you want to do it yeah right and with my agent say okay no we, we don't want to we don't want to be attached to one team being in the second round in the 58, 59 spot, usually they send you to Europe or they watch you play. And if you ever want to go to the NBA, you have to do it with that team no matter what. And yes. you don't know at that time if they're going to have a spot open or they're going to actually reach out to you and do it. So we prefer it to be free. And in that case, if the situation came along in the future uh, that we weren't expecting it to be right away, we were already looking at teams in Europe, yes, to move yes. to Europe and everything before the Olympics. Um, but everything changed right away and actually made it that, that first year. So the Spurs offer came in, yeah? So this, the Spurs uh, offer, we, we actually were with the national team in Las Vegas and Popovich was right there. And we so had he a, came up to you or to talk or what? We had a scrimmage against the US. Um, we, we played in, in one night and the next morning we were flying uh, to go to Rio and directly. And that morning in, in the airport, actually, Manu Ginobili came to me. He was like, Pato, who's your agent? And I told him his name. <laughs> and he was like, oh, can you give me his phone number? I was like, okay. <laughs> Weird, but <laughs> Not sure. usual. And I gave him the phone number. We actually flew from Las Vegas, I don't know, I think to Houston to do the layover. Landed in Houston at my agent. I had like four phone calls missed. I was like, what's going on? actually called him he was like we had an offer from the spurs we had to give an answer i was like manu what the hell <laughs> and i was like i'm not gonna say no to the spurs obviously it wasn't an offer for a guarantee contract for many years it was just to to do the training camp and fight for a spot yeah and, and on the team and maybe go to the d league um but i mean for us for argentinians when we hear the word spurs san antonio spurs it's like well, this is like the top, yeah. this is the best thing with Manu, with the championships, with Duncan, with Tony at the moment, with Kawhi, with Pop, it was just... The, Alberto also the, played Alberto there. Alberto played there. It was just, for us, that was the ultimate goal to play with the Spurs with Manu. That was every kid's dreaming about that. And when I got the call, I was like, yes, I don't care if they pay me two cents <laughs> for the whole thing, I'm going to do it. So did and, Manu broker you a deal? for the Spurs or, or what? And apparently, Pop talked to Manu saying that he liked me and, and Nico La Provitola and Nico had a, a contract with a different team so we had they had to manage some other things. I was free and Pop asked Manu to get my agent's info and they called him right away and that happened in like 20 minutes. I was going to San Antonio. <laughs> but what's Therefore. up with the Spurs liking Argentinian so much? And that's crazy. San Antonio is, I feel like it's a little like Shockers. Uh, they, they usually get these players that are not really known and they work them and they get them to the highest level to explode. And that's what happened with, with Manu. Nobody knew him. He was playing here in, in Kinder Bologna in Italy. He was killing it, but he was young, not really known. Yeah. 
And when he got there, it exploded. Same with Oberto that wasn't really known, played for, for Vasconia. Um, but in Vasconia at that time, it was Scola, um, Pablo Prigioni going, being the superstars, and he was okay. I went to San Antonio, and they're just superstars right away. Maybe Greg f- Popovich fell in love with the Argentinians, but oh, I love these people. They, so they, they, I mean, obviously they have that connection with Manu with so much history, so many championships. It's just his personality is, is so lovable. They they really like it. And I mean, obviously they, they want to have the next Ginobili, the next Tony Parker from France yeah, yeah. or Argentina that they love. They love, obviously in San Antonio, so close to Mexico, they have that connection to Latin America. And... Uh, for me, obviously, they didn't compare me to Ginobili, but for them, it's the attachment. Uh, Manu was going to be supposedly his last year. He kept playing for two more years, <laughs> but they, they wanted to have that connection yeah. a, a little longer. Yeah. So uh, you joined that uh, the whole uh, practice process, yeah, to fight for the spot in the Spurs. Uh, did you have connection with Greg Popovich at that time? Did he, did he tell you, okay, Patricio, we want to send you to the G League now and see what happens? How did it all happen? Well, and throughout the, the whole training camp, it, it was like a, a learning process for, for me and for Nico. The first couple of weeks, everything was like, wow, this is Manu, Tony, Kawhi, Pop. Tim Duncan was retired, but still coming to practice yeah, with yeah. us and everything. So every day was something new that we're living in a dream. But after that, we, okay, we're like, we have a chance to make, make the team. We can fight and everything. And it actually came down to the very last game of the preseason. Uh, after the game, uh, Pop talked to all four of us. It was four of us that we were fighting for, for two spots. Yeah. And they called Nico and they told him he was going to stay. And they called another two guys. And when he called me, he was like, look, you're really close. Uh, we really like you. We could keep you on the team, but we wanted a, a shooter. We need a shooter to have just in case. So they chose this other kid and he told me you're gonna go to the D League we're gonna be watching you closely being there it's not like we're gonna throw you and forget about you we're um, we're gonna go to Austin that was 30 minutes away and they actually went to a couple games with the GM with Pop the players and they were always super close and he's like if the situation comes during the the season you know somebody gets hurt or we need something we're, we're gonna call you it, it didn't happen but it ended up happening with a different team, with Orlando, actually, with the Magic. And I ended up finishing the season with them. So that whole experience was just like a, a dream. Just starting to play next to Manu is uh, a god from, from Argentina, being close to him and going to his house, meeting his family and acting like we were friends from forever. And then moving to the D League, that is something different, but it really helped me as individually as a player. And finishing, actually playing in, in the NBA is that whole year is one of the best years in my life. Uh, from what you said, I realized that Mano is like a very down to earth guy. Yeah, like very simple, very, very, very friendly guy. Super, super. I mean, the first day that we got there, we flew to San Antonio on a Sunday morning with Nico. We landed at like, seven eight in the morning in san antonio and we were waiting for our bags and we actually have the same agent calling our agent he's like who's gonna pick us up like nobody's here it's eight <laughs> in the morning we don't know where to go and he's like no no someone is coming don't worry so we were waiting outside we see a car coming somebody came down he's like, manu what are you doing here? <laughs> no, I came to guys pick, pick you up so we can go get some breakfast. You you can get settled. We're going to go home with my family, have some lunch later, and we can relax. We're like, Manu, it's Sunday morning, 8 in the morning, and you came to pick us up? It's like, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and right there, we, we went to breakfast, and then we went to his house. And after we were supposed to go to the hotel, settle down, like sleep and, and rest, and he just grabbed a key and threw it to us. He's like, here you go. A car key. We're like, what is this, man? Oh, it's a car for you so you can go around and see <laughs> the city and everything. So like that, he gave us a car to go around and everything was just like, we're friends. Like, I mean, we, we know him. Nico knew him more from playing before with him. Yeah. My first time playing with him was in, in Rio. Um, and he treated me like we were friends since we were like kids. Crazy. Yeah. 
that was described the legend also you know that that simple character yeah so simple and it, you you could tell that that morning when we went to breakfast they the way they treated him at the little restaurant that we went it's like oh my god you're you're god here manu we sat at a table a private we there you're not gonna pay everything is taken care of and manu so simple it's like oh okay thank you like dressed like super casually and she's behaving like he's a super normal guy not manu ginobili <laughs> And at that season, uh, as you mentioned, you were thrown a possibility to sign a 10-day contract with the Orlando Magic, yeah? After that expired, uh, did you know that, uh, okay, I'm going to go to Europe or you were still waiting for the offers maybe in the off-season to come? Well, actually, it, I signed a three-year contract yeah. with that season guaranteed and I'm uh, <laughs> fighting for a spot for the next two seasons. So I was there the whole summer working out and and I was gonna play summer league, but then in Orlando was rebuilding the whole program. They fired the GM and the whole front office that they actually brought me. Yeah. So everything changed right there. I ended up not really playing much in the in the summer league, and they cut me. And it was a little weird. It was almost at the end of the summer before we played with the national team that I was a free agent with no yeah. team. And then we had to scramble and uh, look for teams in, in Europe. And I had a few offers, but at that time, Prigioni was going to be the head coach of Basconia. Ah, right. So we had that, that connection. And in another, another place, I love Argentinians. And, <laughs> and we made that happen. So uh, it wasn't that hard of a decision again. <laughs> uh, but Prigioni would. The the plan with the Prigioni quickly changed, yeah? He wasn't the head coach. And did you at that time, oh, man, I'm in a situation where he's no, not sure again, yeah? Yes, yes. It, it was weird. I actually signed a three-year contract with Basconia, thinking that Pablo was going to be there for, for a long time, but it didn't really work out. He was there for like three months, and he, he led the team. Uh, because the results weren't that good. He wasn't happy. First time that he was coaching, yeah. uh, he retired the year before and went straight into coaching in, in EuroLeague in a team that is very well known. So it, it was a lot of things going on. And when he left, I was like, okay, what's going to happen now? <laughs> uh, they brought this Spanish coach that didn't know me at all. He didn't know who I was. You mean uh, Spanish uh, coach, which one? Pedro Martinez. Ah, Pedro Martinez, yeah. First Pedro. Uh, he didn't know me. He didn't know how I played or, or anything. <clears throat> so it was an, another situation that I had to adapt, fight for a spot. I had a few injuries in the middle. So it was a, a tough situation, but ended up being okay. Uh, and we reached the very interesting year, uh, to say at least 2019 for you. Yeah, a couple of injuries at, at the first half of the year. And uh, mm -hmm. I've read uh, our colleague's uh, Donata's interview with you. And at one point you mentioned to him that uh, you're thinking about ending your own career, yeah? Uh, after the, one of the injuries, yeah? yeah. And uh, your wife, yeah, she talked you out of it. Can you briefly tell us how it all happened? Yeah, well, it was this whole situation in, in Basconia. I, I started having a, a few injuries that weren't really my fault. The first, uh, so when Pedro assumed on, on the team, I was trying to fight for a spot and Two weeks after he he came, I broke my jaw. Yeah, uh, so I had. And to you had this it. helmet. To use. Yes, <laughs> this mask that I had to use for the rest of the season, and I, that at the end of the season, I dislocated two fingers. So it was like a bunch of injuries and trying to adapt. And Pedro was a, a tough coach. And the next year, I came back. I started playing well, and uh, one of my teammates fell on my knee, and yeah. I had a distension in, in my knee that took me out. Um, when I was trying to come back, I, I had a distension in, in my hamstring and I was always fighting. The team wasn't doing that well and I'm fighting and they fired the coach, fired Pedro, and they brought um, uh, Pedasovic to the team. So it was another new coach that didn't know me fighting for a spot and got injured again and another injury. And it got to a point that I was just not happy how Too much my life of everything, was. Yeah. It, it, it was... A mix of everything with the injuries, with uh, trying to adapt to the team, trying to fight for minutes. Uh, Basconia is a tough club itself. Uh, practice was super crazy. We weren't happy as a team. And I just didn't love the sports like I, I used to. I thought 
okay, if this is going to be my life, being a pro basketball player, that I'm going to be suffering at home when I have a Sunday afternoon that I'm free and I'm not enjoying life. I'm just worried about tomorrow because I'm, they're going to kill me at practice in the morning and at night. And uh, you have to be thinking about all the time, like, oh, you're always worry about what's going to happen. If, if you lose, you're going to run. If you win, you're going to run even more. And I just, I hated it. And with this injury, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm miserable. I, I want to go home. I don't know if it's me that I have so many injuries or my head or, or the environment or whatever it is. And my wife actually stopped me. She's like, oh, okay, if you want to take a decision, take it. But not right now when you're feeling so low, let's get some help. And I actually started talking to a psychologist to to change my head, basically, that I was in a, in a good place. To program in a new way, yeah? Just, yes. just to look for the best. Yes, for sure. And, and that came at the exact moment that I had a click and I was like, okay, I'm, I remember why I love the sport, even though the environment is not the same, the, the, the best, or we're not winning or anything. I just enjoying life again and enjoying going to practice and living the dream for us to get paid to do what we love is something that we're uh, it's a privilege not that many people can can say that yeah and i started enjoying it again and i actually saw it in a in a different way yes it's, it's a job that we have a lot of responsibilities and a lot of things to do but at the same time we, we can also enjoy life in a in a safe and controlled way I assume that uh, a lot of love also was added after the World Cup uh, tournament in China, yeah? Uh, yes. Did you expect to be selected after that injuries in the first half of the year or it was no problem because of that, because you were healthy at that time before the selection progress? No, I, I was super healthy uh, at the end. I actually finished the season with Bosconia. I played for like two, three months yeah. of the end of the season, so I was in, in great shape. Um, but obviously a, a little nervous. I, I Oh, I suit up for three months. I actually play for like a month and a half, super healthy. Um, I wasn't nervous that I wasn't going to make the team at home because we, we don't have that, that many players. It's not yeah. that much competition. It's always a small selected group. But I didn't know the level that I was going to be at in a World Cup. It's not the same to play in, in a club than in the national team that the tournaments are shorter, that you have to perform at 150 every single time because if you don't, you're going to be eliminated. And it was the first time that this group of, of us with the national team that were so young to play in a, in a big stage against the best teams in the world. We were all nervous, but particularly for me, I was not nervous, uh, but I was waiting to see uh, what level I was. And that click that I made mentally helped me be myself in, in the World Cup and enjoy the whole process and actually perform in pretty well. When I was in China with that uh, World Cup championship working as a journalist, I, I remember even talking to you at one point, one on one interview. And um, I remember the whole buzz around the Argentina team. You were, you were guys like, were super hungry to win, super hungry to win, and super joyful to be around because uh, during uh, the practice before the final, I, I, <laughs> I remember the Spanish team was all locked up, no, no, no interviews, and you guys like, okay, like having fun. <laughs> I remember throwing that half-court shots. Uh, was it, as it looked, was it also a fun to be in that team, to be in that locker room with a Scola, with big name, Scola, huge name in the Argentinian basketball and so on? It's super fun for us. Going to the national team is, is not a sacrifice. It's something that we, we love because this group we all basically the same age. With the oldest is Nico that is 91. We have guys 92, 93, 94, and we all been playing against each other or together or all growing up. So we, we know each other really well. And the good thing, we're friends off the court, not just on the court. Yeah. And we actually vacation together. We All our families are always together. So... Uh, getting together for the national team for us is like a field trip with, with our <laughs> friends. It's, at the same time, obviously, we're representing the, the country, but that's that what made it for us uh, easier, no? The, the, the chemistry that we have led us to that moment and enjoying before the final that we were like yelling, clapping, just throwing half-court shots, a little bit to take the, the nervous, yeah, of course. nervousness out of, of the thing and not put so much pressure on, on ourselves. 
but that was the same thing that we did the whole tournament just before the final and that's what we do before every single tournament no matter if we play in in argentina or in china in the final of the world cup is it's the same feeling we're always in contact with each other uh, to see how we were doing and planning what we're gonna do in the summer and then with the training camp and and the tournaments is something that really helped us it's something that we took from that golden generation they they were the same thing they were friends off the court that got together to play basketball and you can tell that chemistry that is all about the team and not one person, one player, that we, we don't care who scores 20 points or if it's Luis is the face of the team or Campaso is the greatest player that we have in our generation. If they have to be that guy that day, it's great. If I'm, I'm going to be that guy tomorrow, great. If going to be somebody else, uh, we don't care. As long as we win and we have fun, it's all good. After this championship, you suffered ACL injury, yeah? Uh, you mentioned about your brain being programmed in a new way. So it helped after that injury not to lose, uh, I don't know, focus of rehabilitation and going back on the court? Oh, of course. I mean, when, when I had the news that I had the, the injury before, that I had the distension on the knee, I thought the world was going to end, that, I was, that, that was it. And when they gave me the news that I had torn my ACL, that is one of the worst injuries that a basketball but player had. But it didn't feel right away like an ACL injury? Or Well, I, I didn't want to believe yeah, that yeah, it was yeah, that, yeah. but they, they made me all the testing and everything, and it was a, a big chance. And the next day I had to do some MRIs and testing and everything, and they gave me the news 24 hours after the injury happened. Yes. And I was at home with my wife, and actually my physio was in, in town. They gave me the news, I was like, Okay, <laughs> sure. Let's let's get back to the the rehab process, and I felt like it was a ankle sprain the way I, I took it. All right, uh, because of my mind, it was already programmed to enjoy life and accept that we're basketball players. We're we're not sitting in, in an office eight hours a day in front of a computer. We're, we're playing with our bodies and our uh, physics, and the injury is going to happen. Um, to me, it's something that that happened a, a lot of times, and I have to accept that. At the same time, my style of playing is is not super uh, fancy with the swag and everything. I'm more of a physical player yeah. that goes for the hits, that dies for the the loose balls, and my probability of getting injured is a little higher than somebody else that doesn't play with so much energy. And and I accepted it. It, it happened. And obviously, if it wasn't for that, my recovery and the moments that I live, especially through a pandemic that took my rehab process a little slower, uh, it would have been terrible. But I I wouldn't say that I enjoy it because I don't want to be injured and yeah, sitting out. But it, it was not something that I, I suffered through it. I'm Obviously, I have my appens announced and I still have them with uh, rehabbing and having to get surgery again and everything. But I'm happy, uh, obviously. Uh, this change of scenery that come to Shagiris helped me a lot because it's a new environment, new things, new people. You get your mind out of it uh, a little bit. But it was something that if it wasn't for my psychologist, my, my wife and my, my family, uh, I don't think I would be the same person. Uh, how supportive was Jalgris, uh, one when you made your first debut for Jalgris against Pasvelis, Pianos uh, Vegas Pasvelis team, and then you had to be uh, sit out uh, because of the the re reoccurred injury, yeah, because of the knee injury. So how supportive Jalgris was at that time? Incredible. Uh, I remember when I got the news that I had to get surgery again. I actually talked to Coach Martin, and I was like. Look, if they're they're gonna cut me, I, I understand. I came here with an ACL, not playing for for a while with the pandemic that I had to get a, a few months to get going. And this is not the club's fault. It's not my fault either. I, I did my best, but something is wrong, and I need to get surgery again. If I need to go home and and say goodbye to the team, that's that's it. I, I so understand. So you were ready. You were ready for that. I, I was ready. Yeah. I mean, I I felt the situation is not something I didn't want to feel like I was stealing from the team or trying to cheat or anything. Um, and I talked to coach and he was like, mm, I think you're crazy, but th th that's <laughs> not going to happen. And I actually, funny, I, I live in the same building as, as Paulius Montejunas. And I saw him two days after I talked to coach and 
we were talking down there and he was like, I heard that you're thinking you're going to go home. You're, you're crazy. You're going to stay here. You're going to get better. You're going to get healthy. And you're going to kill it here. And that's all that's going to happen. Don't think you're going somewhere because you're not. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is crazy to, to have the GM talk to you so personally, so close and being so invested and, and involved with the team is something that I never experienced before. I didn't, I don't think that many teams have uh, a GM that is so involved in, in such a positive and good way. And for me, it, that gave me a, a new wave of air and, and motivation to, to get better and keep going and not get so uh, stressed out about a, a new surgery and, and having to do the process again. Obviously, that motivated me so, so much to keep going. You made another comeback. We were very happy seeing you throwing that three-pointer, uh, <laughs> uh, being all happy about it. And then uh, you made your debut with Chalgris jersey in EuroLeague. Uh, these first two games, uh, how was your body working, adapting to the levels? I think there was a sense of caution. You had to be a bit cautious on the court, not to be re-injured again. Yes, uh, obviously when they gave me the news that I was going to debut again and, and, and play for the first time, they gave me the news, I think coach told me a, a week before the game, just to you be You mean ready. Euroleague or Elko? No, Elko, yeah, the first okay, game, sorry. yeah. And I talked to him one afternoon and I think for the next two, three days I was freaking out that it, something <laughs> was going to happen and remembering the, the way I injured my leg and if I had to do a layup and put weight, it was going to happen. And I was freaking out, scared actually to get re-injured and something that I didn't want to happen. But again, with the help of the psychologist, my wife, trying to rewire my brain again and having confidence that I, I did my job working with Sigitas every single day in the weight room. I We did everything and, and the knee is good. It's all mental. And three, four days before the game, I felt, I felt good. The day of the game i was nervous just because of the situation having to suit up after so long and 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 having to play a game it was the same nervous that everybody guy everybody feels before a game and as soon as i step on the court i forgot about everything and i was just playing obviously i wasn't myself yet in the sense of my my body wasn't as fast or running uh so like usual or jumping so high is something that I needed a little more time, but I feel, I feel great. I was just happy, like a smile on my face the whole time, even making that first shot. That's something that I wasn't expecting and it happened. It just gave me so, so much joy and so happiness. Great to hear that, man. And now we move to our listeners' questions. We have a lot of them because, well, you're a popular guy, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of Jalgris players, they are very popular on the social uh, media channels. Uh, they get asked a lot of questions. You're not an exception one. <laughs> And um, I'm just going to read who asked the question and uh, what other question. And after that, you're going to choose one, your favorite question, all right? Uh -huh. And we're going we're gonna to award that person with Jalik Shop Production. Yes. All right. <clears throat> So before I start, I just want to I just want to mention if if you guys want to have something like Patricia has today with the Shalgris shirt, or you want to have uh, this little beautiful ball, or another thing is, you can go on shalgrishop.lt. You can choose uh, from the new collection they have for for summer for uh, for. For all the upcoming warm days that you can show your Jargris love, your green and white love, so go to jargrishop.lt. Jeigu nesupratot ką aš nekėjau, jūs galite tiesiog nukeliauti į Jargris shopą, įsirinkti iš naujos kolekcijos, pasirūpinkite pavasarišką, žaliai, balta, aprangą. So in both languages, I think we're good. And sure everything. All right. <laughs> uh, by the way, do you know something in Lithuanian? Yes, but it's not something that I could say. In public. <laughs> All right, so after we uh, finish recording this, you're gonna. Say after it. we can have a conversation of things that I'm not supposed to say in public. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna show my worst Spanish words, and you're gonna show your worst Lithuanian words. Nice. All right. <laughs> Athena Sen asks, the most surprising thing in Lithuania for you? Mm, I said the food. Food, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really good. It's something that I didn't know much about it. And I was a little nervous, at obviously being next to Russia, I thought it was gonna be something like the Russian culture. 
but I we love it. The food here is is amazing. I'm gonna ask you uh, that all question I I ask all the time for my for my friends from uh, uh, from other countries. I know. Did you try Cipollini? That thing with the meat inside. Yes. Yes. You tried it's it. Super good. And super the good. pink soup, the cold pink the be soup. Beet soup. Yeah, yeah, I love beets. That's really good. I mean. I, The even the the fry bread with with cheese we yeah. we tried everything and it's it's really good. What about the beer? That's something that surprised me as well. At home we're we're really known for the um, uh, handcraft uh, beers. Yeah, and wines of course. And yeah. well, wines of course too. But now it's it's a generation thing uh, that is <laughs> is the beer is getting really popular. And here, I mean, it's amazing. It's just walking around, seeing the Wolfus uh, building <laughs> and everything. We're like, okay, we have to try the beer. Apparently, it's really good. And sorry, I'm, I don't know if I'm supposed to say brands, uh, but <laughs> we tried. I didn't try too many, the same. <laughs> yeah. But really like it, yeah. All right. Uh, oh, I have this language question. Ernesta asks, what is your favorite Lithuanian word? <laughs> That from the good, uh, from the good, <laughs> from the good side. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know the numbers. The, the <laughs> I numbers? guess they, I don't know. I that. really love the number five. Uh, uh, really, <laughs> <laughs> Diana. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, okay, we can skip on this one, but uh, I can tell you a short story. Uh, 18 years ago or 17 years ago, there was like a TV crew in the Jalgiris locker, and they made the. This uh, live reportage for the for the their show, mm -hmm. and they ask one American player, Ed Cotta, does he know any bad words in Lithuania? And he just start throwing every <laughs> everything he knows. So the whole arsenal. <laughs> yeah, the good thing is you're not throwing, <laughs> but it's all right. Um, Zagalinis asks, or Zagalinis asks, do you have a favorite song in Lithuanian language? <laughs> Uh, I didn't hear that many, but the guys play all the time Margarita. <laughs> oh my God. And that's really catchy. <laughs> yeah, that's catchy, but not so good though. <laughs> <laughs> Karolis uh, Remika asks, Pato, do you like Lithuanian food and which is the best? So we know that you like, but which is the best? The best? Uh, I don't know. We're going to go with the safe with the kibina. All right. I really like that. All right. Yeah. Vichulis Bichulis asks, which restaurants do you often go? Well, you not you can't go right now. You can sit only outside, but yes. maybe you, you have some. Oh, we go to so many <laughs> all the time. I mean, in the walkway, I think we've been to almost every restaurant, and we really like. All we, right, so you're we, we like there. the the mixture of everything from Italian, Mexican, Lithuanians, um, sushi. You can get anything, and we tried everything. <laughs> Uh, Kotrina asks, what is your dog's name? Moshi. Moshi, yeah? Moshi. Does it have like a story behind the name? Uh, actually, Japanese? Moji is Japanese for uh, is, uh, the, the little food and the way they say uh, hello on the phone. But we actually heard it from a song from Steve Aoki uh, with my wife. Um, we were playing that song for forever and we thought Moshi sounded like a monster's name or something <laughs> and it's actually a really good name because the dog is a monster <laughs> all right raminta asks how do you imagine your perfect day my perfect day um with this weather <laughs> really sunny really hot waking up um playing basketball having empanada having an empanada for for lunch uh going to the beach in the middle being somewhere in a nice city that you can go out to a restaurant and maybe go out later uh, with my wife and friends. Nice. Sounds yeah. like a very perfect day. Uh, Viva asks, if you could be in the one place of any person, what would it be if you can go into that person's body? Good question. Hmm. Obviously some NBA player, uh, I guess being around... Manu, uh, for us, is, is the dream to live his life. That right. would be crazy. All right. Uh, Katrina asks, what is your favorite player of all time? It's not Manu, actually. I, I admire him. Actually, it's not Manu. It's, it's, <laughs> but it's not Manu. I always look up to Andres Nocioni, Chapu oh, Nocioni. Nice. Uh, I, see, I see more of my game in, in his game. 
Manu is is our god. Obviously, we we admire him and and everything, but it's something that is so far away that I couldn't get close to him per se. Um, with with Nocioni is is someone that I feel identified growing up and the way he plays and his aggressiveness and his character is something that I I love and someone that I try to mirror my game. Uh, one more question from Zagalinis. Uh, what does uh, what does your tattoo mean? Well, I have plenty of tattoos. I have one with my friends from my club from home, one with my best friend, another one with my older best friend. I have angel wings because of my granddad, and I have a bull in the other side of my chest from my family from the the countryside. So, how many have tattoos? Uh, seven. Seven. All right. Uh, World Edis asks: Is there uh, a meaning behind your jersey number? Uh, well, I usually, all growing up, I wore 13 because of Nocioni. I got to the national team and Nocioni was playing, so I wasn't going to wear 13, obviously. Yeah. And I chose 29 uh, because of 2009 was a great year for me that I moved to the States and won a big championship at home with my friends. And that's what I wore uh, all these years. But I changed it this year because I thought it was time to change and start over. And seven is a little uh, gift to my, my wife. Uh, it's, it's her favorite number. It's the day she was born. And actually, it's, it's her lucky number. And we see it everywhere. So it's a little bit to say thank you to my wife that I'm, I'm here because of her. So that's why number seven. Nice. Nice, man. Uh, Slaudidis asks, what, what is the most memorable advice you got from the coach? Uh, which coach? Uh, any coach? Any coach from your career? <laughs> um, be myself. And, uh, the way I, I play, always not trying to do too much to prove anybody. It's just the, the way I, I am as a person and as a player is what got me here. And that's something that I should never lose. Obviously, all these coaches advise you on how to train, how to eat, how to sleep, how to play. But just be yourself, not not trying to to do so much and stay true to yourself. All right, we have another interesting question. Well, it's gonna be more interesting when I add something spicy. <laughs> Patricia asks, "Do you have a pregame ritual that you do before every game?" And now for the interesting part, Rokas Yokubaitis uh, put his own uh, thing into this question, and he he uh, tried to asking you this. Tell us to everyone what you do with Rockas before every game, <laughs> because it seems like you guys have a ritual. <laughs> yes. Well, I used to have a routine uh, before that it had to be very specific with a schedule, waking up, going to practice, napping, eating the same things before games. But I feel so robotic that if something went yeah. wrong, my whole thing was going to be messed up. So now I don't really have anything. Uh, every day is a different thing. Yesterday before the game, it was so nice out. We went out to eat to a restaurant, some lunch, and it's something that I w wouldn't have done before. So now it's more about relaxing and enjoying, maybe playing some video games, talking to friends, going on a four hour walk for, with the dog. So nothing really specific. But with Rokas, we, we do have a, a connection before before the game <laughs> with all these stupid challenges on, on social media. We always joking all the time when we see each other. We're like... <laughs> 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 and that's all we do. We think it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, man. It's going to be huge on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. You rock it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. For whew, to, to catch a breath, uh, another question, <laughs> just to loosen up a bit. Uh, Dovidas asks, asks uh, tell us stories about Argentine national team. How is Luis Scola like a person and a player? Obsessed, obsessed with basketball. All he does is breathe, eat, sleep basketball. It's crazy. His mind is programmed to do anything that he can to be the best player that he can. It's always researching on, on the internet, talking to people with contacts, the ways that uh, he can sleep better with sleep monitors, with rings, with capsules to get more recovery. Um, 
That's he how, even that's why he plays now. That's why day. he plays when now that he's forty one years old and keep playing like he's twenty seven. His mind is just all about basketball. In in his farm at home, he built a basketball court in the middle of nowhere so he can go back and and practice and uh, with weights and a kitchen and a place to sleep. Everything in his life is about basketball, and that's the way he is. All, all we talk about is is basketball. It was like, okay, mm-hmm. Luis, we let's go enjoy, go somewhere to eat so we can relax. It was like, okay, sure. And we're at the dinner table uh, talking about basketball. It's like all the time, all he does. <laughs> so let me get it straight. So Manu Ginobili is like Argentina's Michael Jordan, yeah? Yes. Uh, Luis Cola is like Argentina's LeBron James. Yes. <laughs> all right, so we got it straight then. All right. Uh, Marcinonis asks, or Marcinonis asks, can you tell little known facts about Argentina? Maybe something that is unique only for this country. Interesting question. I, I don't know. What's unique about us? Not that many people know. Well, obviously, we know. <laughs> we're we're basically Europeans. All, all of us are either Italians, Spanish, Germans. You have Italian passport. Yeah. I have an Italian passport. My whole well, my great great grandparents from both sides were from Italy. So it's a country of immigrants. We yeah. don't really have true Argentinians. The true Argentinians were Indians, that there are not that many around anymore. And some people have roots uh, next to, to them, but all of us were basically Europeans. The way if you go to Italy and from Italy you go to Argentina, you're like, okay, it's the same place. <laughs> it's the same thing. Parle Italiano? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Kernus Linkiewicz asks, Pato, was the telenovela Floricenta as popular in Argentina <laughs> as it was in Lithuania? Yes. <laughs> it's crazy. It's now that all these actors that are grown up and we're finding out that they're so popular in, in Europe, in Lithuania, in Turkey, and in so many places. We're like, it's a novel from Argentina <laughs> in Spanish that you guys saw here and they're super popular here. It's crazy, but yeah, we. I mean, I didn't watch that show specifically. It's a little more early, uh, but my wife watched all this. Shows Do you know Cata Salvaje? Cata yes. Salvaje, <laughs> con tu pasión. All right, <laughs> Thomas Patalavich says, "Do you have any friends from your childhood that play basketball in Euroleague or NBA?" Well, it's pretty obvious you have, but can you name? Well, some? from my childhood. No, really. Oh, not uh, from your child, yeah, from your yes. youth days, yeah. From growing up, yeah, obviously, Campasso, Nicola Bravitola, growing up playing, uh, Campasso playing in the same city as me, now Bildosa, Deg, all the guys from the national team, we all know each other since we're like 16-year-olds that we started playing with the national team. So all the guys that are here, we all really good friends. Uh, Campazzo, Gabriel Deck, Luca Vildoza, they all went to NBA. Well, Luca Vildoza will, will join next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's up with that? How <laughs> it's happen? it's well, a trend. It's, it's getting all the Argentinians going to the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they deserve it, though. They, they've been on, on the radar for, for a while for different cases, contracts. They couldn't go there earlier, but they could have. And the way I think... The World Cup in, in China gave us the, that yeah. booth that we proved that we could play at the, at the highest level and they're, they're going to prove it in the NBA that they're, they can play at that level. Is there uh, some kind of Argentinian Luka Doncic right now in, in Argentina that we don't know yet about in Lithuania? Uh, if you don't know it, I don't know it either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we don't like doing that to put in so much pressure on a kid saying that it's going to be the next Ginobili or the next Scola. Obviously, Bolmaro is the yeah, highest sure, draft yeah. pick that we had in, in our history. And we we like to stay away from it. He's not going to be the next Manu. He's going to be Leandro Bolmaro. And, and he's, he's going to join Minnesota best. Timberwolves next season. Hopefully, yes. All right. Uh, Emilia asks, if there's one thing you could tell the younger generations, what would it be? Um, to work, it, nothing, nothing is is given. Uh, there are not that many Luka Doncic's in in the world or Manu Ginobili's that they have this crazy talent. It's it's all about work. And today there are so many distractions in our lives. And I feel like the childhoods of people change so much. We used to go to the club and sp- spend the whole day there. Now with social media, with computers, with video games, there are so many things around and. 
they see so many videos of the NBA that they want to be the next Steph Curry and shoot from half court and have these crazy handles, but that's not going to happen uh, because you watch a video, you have to spend time in the gym. You have to work, but at the same time, enjoy it. It's, it's a good process. The, the sport is, is beautiful to spend time with, with your friends and you learn so many values that are not just for the basketball court, but outside. So if, if you work hard, you're going to have some fun and you should enjoy it. All right. Livia asks, imagine you have three tickets to the best party in Las Vegas. Which three <laughs> teammates from Jaligris uh, you will uh, travel together with? You're choosing. <laughs> Oh, well, Marius is pretty crazy, so he has to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yankee has all the connection in the whole world, so not even in Lithuania. Con so connection he, guy, yeah. Yes, he knows everybody. And the third one is a tough one. I, I, I take an, uh, an American that knows where to go. I go with Thomas. All right. And a uh, similar question to it, but uh, another point of view. Jaligrina asks, imagine you're taking part in the singing competition and you have to choose two teammates to be in your group. <laughs> So once again, what are you choosing? The best singers from Jalgiris team? Uh, Nigel is singing the whole time. I wouldn't say he's a great singer, but he sings, so <laughs> he'll be one. And why not? Just to make him suffer, I take Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Just not to be the worst singer in that group? <laughs> no, so he has to do something in public and talk. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. That's harsh, man. All right. Uh, the last question uh, comes from, from our partners, Kona Akropolis, Akropolis Konas. And uh, Kona Akropolis, dabar yra viena iš tų stilingiausių ir madingiausių vietų Kaune, kur kar galima rasti apsirengti visiškai, ką jūs norite artimiausiam šiam šiltam uh, pavasariui, besibaigiančiam ir vasarios periodui ir neveltui. Kauno Akropolis yra vadinamas mado sosnė. Ir... Trumpam pakalbėkime apie stilių ir aprangą. So let's talk about fashion and style in your life. And the first question is, which of Jalgiris players are the most fashionable and the most stylish uh, in his own way? So who are you choosing? In his own way is a great, great clarification because he thinks he's <laughs> the greatest, greatest fashion guy and it has to be Jojo because he's from France and he's <laughs> living that life. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Uh, okay. Well, that's an interesting question because uh, back in the day, it was hard to uh, put uh, basketball players' fashion in the frame when, when it came to NBA. We remember Allen Iverson to be like a pioneer and to popularize his own fashion, you know, that, the whole fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever played in the team where they had restrictions on what you have to wear before the game or something like this? No, <laughs> no, I haven't been part of it, but I I can see that happening now with all these trends from the NBA that guys go uh, with shirts with holes in, the, in their <laughs> chest and crazy outfits. I can see teams, especially in Europe, having some guidelines to keep it a little more serious Business and, and focus. Song, yeah. yeah, yeah, but never happened to me. Uh, what are your favorite brands or... Or clothing in general you like to wear? Do you have your favorite style? Uh, not really into fashion. <laughs> My <laughs> wife dresses me, basically. <laughs> I'm more of a sports casual, just with yoggins and a hoodie. Um, I don't really have a favorite brand. I usually shop in, in Sada or Mango is the brands that I know. <laughs> All right. And the last question, uh, do you have your favorite sneakers or the, f uh, the favorite sneakers of all time, or maybe legendary sneakers for you because you fell in love, maybe your first sneaker shoes and so on, the brand um, and so on? Not first one, but I have a lot of Air Force ones. Oh, nice. Yes. And I have it in all different colors and models. I, I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So if we see Air Force sneakers, maybe that's uh, Pato coming. Yeah. Yes, for sure. <laughs> All right. So Pato, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a great fun to talk to you. It, it was a great fun seeing your face. You do with Rockas. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we wish you a good end of the season, of course. And uh, hopefully we're going to see you next year playing here. Hopefully too. I would love that.
Thank you. Thank you, Pato. And uh, thank you for all of our listeners. Ačiū visiems mūsų klausytojams ir žiūrojams, kurie stebėte ir žiūrite ar klausotės šį Žalgirį Sonier podcastą, kad ir kur jūs tą bedarytumėte. Nepamirškite mūsų sekti Žalgirį YouTube kanale, nepamirškite sekti mūsų visose social media platformose, nepamirškite tapti ir Žalgirį Insider nariu, ten jūsų laukia papildomo turinio mylėjai visuomet jo ten rasite. Šiam kartui tiek, iki, bye. Taip skamba tavo nauja elektroninė parduotuvė. Savo elektroninę parduotuvę Mario susikūrė su Zairo. Su Zairo neužtruksi. Išsirinki dizainą, sukeli nuotraukas. Užpildai aprašymus. Elektroninė parduotuvė sukasi. Reikia logotipo. Susikurk jį per... Paruošta. Nori paklausti? Mūsų komanda pasiruošusi tau padėti visą parą. Pataiki kaip Grigonis. Susikurk svetainę su Zairo. Eiki www.zairo.lt ir su nuolaidos kodu Zalgiris susikurk savo internetinės vietainę vos nuo 1,50 centų per mėnesį.